In this session, we're going to examine the digestive tract of a pig. We're going to begin with the mouth. I think it's a part of the digestive tract that people tend to ignore, but it's a very important one. It's the gateway to the digestive tract. And so we're going to look at it in this pig. Uh, of course, this is the head. And uh, the mouth serves uh, a couple of functions uh, as far as digestion is concerned. It's the, uh, the gateway to the digestive tract. And there actually is some digestive activity that goes on in the mouth. And we'll see how both of those uh, occur. Um, if we look on the inside, we open this up. I think you can see uh, the major structures of the mouth that are, that are important and relative, uh, relevant to digestion. Uh, those being the snout or the lips area. Those, are, of course, are important for food acquisition. Um, the tongue, uh, also an important structure as far as food acquisition goes. Many of our uh, livestock and other mammal species actually use their tongue as a way of grasping food and bringing it into the mouth. And so together, the tongue and the, and the lips are kind of soft tissue uh, uh, structures that can help manipulate the food and, and bring it into the, into the mouth. The tongue, of course, has another function. It's the primary structure as far as the sense of taste goes. And being able to taste the food is important to, uh, to animals because they very often can recognize toxic substances based on the taste. And so having the tongue here is, again, sort of serves as a gateway function, uh, helping the animal, uh, or pre help preventing the animal from taking in potentially toxic uh, uh, material. Um, the other main structure that's involved here with, uh, in digestion, or, or food acquisition, say, um, are the teeth. What we've done is switch now to, to a skull so that you can get a good look at all the different types of teeth that you have uh, in a mammal's mouth. And a pig is an excellent example of a species and to, to show that. Um, I'm going to lift the, the upper part of the jaw, the maxillary part, portion of the jaw, off. And now you should have a good look at all of the teeth in this pig's mouth. And um, when we talk about teeth, typically we will we'll talk about them in, in describing a species. We'll look at both the number and the types of teeth that that animal has. And so <clears throat> we'll start at the midline. And then we can go either left or right. It doesn't really matter which side you go to because we assume symmetry on both sides. And so we'll just start with this upper jaw and look at the different types of teeth the pig has here. Um, and we'll, we'll go along uh, the animal's right side, which you would see looking at it on your left. Um, so the first type of teeth you come to are incisors. Those three, again, starting from the midline, you have three incisors right along here, one, two, three. Um, those are the front teeth. They're involved in food acquisition. Um, they're sort of somewhat peg-like, especially the bottom ones that we'll see in a minute. Uh, and really are almost, uh, their function is kind of almost like a raking function. They can get behind berries or some other uh, object and kind of strip them off the, um, off of the, uh, the stems and, and that. Um, and so, again, they, they can, you know, manipulate the food, help ac acquire the food. The next type of tooth that you come to are the canines, okay, and there'll be just one of these, uh, you know, and this is what forms a large tusk in pigs um, and can be very large in, in a lot of species and uh, is also involved in food acquisition. Um, those tusks uh, can grow very large, those canine teeth in carnivores and, uh, you know, of course be used by them in capturing and killing their prey but also useful in the case of a pig, uh, trying to root around in the dirt or, or whatever, looking for grubs and truffles or whatever. And uh, so the, those canines are involved in food acquisition as well. So these first two types of teeth, incisors 
and the canine are involved in food acquisition. And this is the typical count that you see in mammals. The ancestral count is what we call it. If you look at primitive fossil mammals, they'll have three incisors and then a single canine. The next type of teeth that you come to are premolars, and then the last type are molars. And the pig, again, is very typical of the mammalian ancestral type in that it has four premolars on, one, on each side and then three molars. And these are teeth that are involved in processing food. Um, in the case of the pig, it would be a grinding function to help grind food material down. Uh, in the case of something like a dog or a cat that eats primarily meat, these have a scissor-like function and they'll shear uh, the food into smaller pieces. So, uh, but, but again, it's these cheek teeth, the premolars, and again, there are four of these in the pig, one, two, three, four, and then one, two, three molars, okay? If we look on the bottom jaw, we see essentially the same thing. We have one, two, three incisors, and then a canine, and then one, two, three, four premolars, and then one, two, three, one, two, three molars, okay? Um, and then again, just like we said for the, for the upper jaw, incisors and canines, primarily for food acquisition, premolars and molars, primarily for uh, food processing, for in this case for grinding, okay? So that's a quick look at, at teeth. Okay, the next function uh, that, that occurs in the mouth is, the, uh, is actual digestion. And uh, that's accomplished in two ways. Um, you have mechanical digestion, physically breaking down the food material into smaller pieces. And that's done primarily by uh, these teeth. Uh, we call them the cheek teeth collectively. Those are the premolars and the molars. Um, so those are, those are teeth that actually grind or shear the food and reduce the size of the particles. And then um, there is some mixing activity, another form of mechanical digestion. The tongue sort of manipulates those particles, moves it around in the mouth, facilitates chewing, and it also helps dis distribute saliva. And saliva is the next really important component uh, in digestion here in the mouth. The saliva is secreted by salivary glands. You can see one very nicely right, right in here. This is, this is one of the salivary glands. Uh, see one on the inside over here as well. Uh, those secrete saliva, and saliva has a number of functions. The, at first, it's a liquid, right? It's an aqueous-based liquid, and so some of the food material can actually be dissolved in the saliva. It has a lubricating function softens, helps soften the food uh, together with chewing, makes it much easier for the animal to swallow the food. Um, saliva also has buffering capacity, so it can reduce the acidic or strong basic nature of some foods, uh, make them more, more palatable, more tolerable down as they move in the digestive tract. And, and saliva also has enzymes, uh, in particular an enzyme called petiolin that uh, is an amylase, that's a, an enzyme that breaks down starch. And so all of those functions here, saliva, saliva contribute to the uh, first part of digestion of the food material that comes in. So um, that's the main type of activity that goes on, uh, digestive activity that goes on in the mouth. Uh, the food material, after it's been chewed, will, will move down so here's, here's uh, of course, the tongue, and the esophagus is right back here. And then this is the opening of the larynx uh, into the respiratory tract. Uh, it sits just above the esophagus. 
So we've looked at the, the mouth as the first part of the digestive tract in the pig. Now we're going to move on to the, the rest of the digestive tract. And what we've tried to do here is lay the tract out roughly in the way it would be situated in the animal if you were looking at its uh, belly and opened up the animal. And so we start up here. Uh, this is the esophagus coming from the mouth. And then the esophagus empties into the stomach. Right now the, sc the stomach is covered with a, a membranous sheath called the omentum. And we're going to examine that more closely in a, in a few minutes. Um, but that's, that's the general pattern. The stomach sits right here, just on the, the left side of the uh, animal's body. And then you see the liver here, very important organ as far as digestion is concerned. Okay? It's where, uh, where some of the chemical agents involved in digestion are produced. Uh, the food would go down the esophagus, into the stomach, and then out of the stomach and into the small intestine. And so all of this material that you see here, these loose coils of, of tubular uh, material, okay, this is all small intestine. And of course, a lot of digestion, chemical digestion goes on in the small intestine. And then as it moves out of the small intestine, it moves into the large intestine, and that's what you see here. These very large uh, diameter, uh, again, tubular portion. Uh, this is the main site of microbial digestion in, in a pig. And then, uh, then the food material would pass out of the uh, large intestine into the, the rectum, and then on out the animal here. You can see the urinary bladder is also attached in this particular tract, uh, but of course it has a separate opening, uh, separate uh, as far as uh, uh, waste material uh, elimination goes. So I'm gonna first thing I'm gonna do is remove that urinary bladder. Don't, doesn't really have any function for us as far as digestion of food is concerned. So uh, we can get rid of it. Um, and here you go, just get me a, a place, something I can toss that stuff as we don't need it. Yeah, that's good, that's good. Okay, so um, we'll start up here at the stomach end. We'll start with the esophagus. And uh, the esophagus really doesn't contribute anything to digestion. It's merely a way of moving the food from the mouth and moving it down to the stomach. Um, you know, it's gonna pass through the thoracic cavity where the lungs and the heart are located. And uh, so it's essentially just a conduit. I'm gonna tie a string around it because I don't want any of the digestive material that's, that's in there to leak out of the esophagus. And that'll help keep things a little bit tidy here as we work on dissecting this. that on there like so. And now we'll focus on the stomach. And as I said, the stomach is covered by this membranous structure called the omentum. And I'm going to remove the omentum. And we can talk about it a little bit as I do that. Um, the omentum is a, a very loose membrane, but it's the way the stomach is attached, the main way the stomach is attached to the body wall uh, along the backbone, along the spine. And so it helps keep the stomach in place, but it has another very important function. And when I hold it up, and you can see what it looks like in its entirety. Now I'll put this stomach back out like so. Okay, with the omentum removed. Okay, there is the omentum. And I think you can recognize that there's this network of uh, white 
material embedded in that membrane. It almost looks like lace, the way it's uh, structured there. That, uh, that's fat that's being deposited there. And so the omentum is one of the main places that the body stores fat. And this is true in all mammals. So this membranous system that wraps around the stomach is one of the areas where there are lots of adipocytes. Those are cells that, that make fat and store fat. That's where they're primarily located. And you get this nice network because those cells uh, sit right over blood vessels. And so you're really seeing the pattern of blood, vas blood, blood flow throughout the omentum there. And then the, the adipocytes, the fat cells, just taking up fat from the blood and storing it uh, within themselves. And there's another structure that you see associated with the omentum. And uh, this is the spleen. And the spleen doesn't serve any digestive function. The spleen is a source uh, for production of blood cells, uh, a lot of uh, white blood cells from the immune system, macrophages and, and other uh, uh, white blood cells that are involved in combating infection. Okay, so it's really part of the animal's immune system, much more so than it is part of the digestive system. So we have the spleen and the omentum, both uh, associated there with the, with the stomach. So now, We'll move down and look, look at the stomach. Okay, I'm gonna flip this over. Now we'd be almost looking at it like we would from the back side of the animal. And we'll have a little bit better view of how the esophagus enters into the stomach. So, so there, yeah, actually doesn't, that didn't help much at all. I'm gonna flip it back. <laughs> there, okay. So, there's the esophagus again, and I'm gonna just dissect away some of the liver. piece of the, the diaphragm here, that uh, the musculature that helps control the, the breathing in the, in the lungs. And so that's what I'm trying to deflect away. Now I think you can see quite nicely how the esophagus enters into the stomach there. Okay, esophagus comes into the stomach. This, sure. So come in something like that. All right. And then I'm going to just dissect a little bit of this tissue down here at the lower end, away. Yeah, okay. 
Very good. Okay, so that's the stomach. And right there, you can see the esophagus coming in. I'm going to detach, well, so let me just show you. We'll follow the whole stomach. There's the stomach. Uh, and then at the very furthest end of the stomach is a very hard kind of a knot-like uh, structure. It's the pyloric sphincter. And that's what uh, prevents food from moving out of the stomach and on into the small intestine. That sphincter is closed most of the time, so food material coming in uh, will stay there. Uh, the digestive enzymes and so on that are added uh, in the stomach um, uh, have plenty of time then to work on the food in the stomach and uh, facilitate the digestion. And so that's, uh, that's why that sphincter is there. And then it's only after an adequate amount of time that we've had for chemical digestion here in the stomach, then it allows the, uh, uh, the sphincter will relax and allow the food material to move on down uh, into the small intestine. I'm going to separate the stomach from the small intestine here at the point uh, just at the uh, pyloric sphincter. And that'll allow us then to again get another sort of a look at the, at the stomach isolated uh, there. And then right, so the food would come in and then it generally spends most of its time down in this lower portion of the stomach. And uh, of course, as I alluded to before, the stomach is a site of uh, chemical digestion. Stomach adds hydrochloric acid and uh, uh, pepsin, a proteolytic enzyme, and together those uh, begin the breakdown of protein that's uh, in there, uh, in, in the food. We're going to express a little bit of the contents uh, from the stomach out. I hope that this isn't too <laughs> offensive to anyone, <laughs> but uh, you can see uh, commercial hogs are fed a diet of corn and soybean meal. And you can see that's essentially what, what it looks like at this point. Uh, really, I mean, what's, we've begun a little bit of digestion of the protein that's in there. So this really doesn't look much different from the way it came in. Uh, like I said, we're just beginning to digest some of the protein. Uh, done a little bit of chewing uh, where necessary, but for the most part, that's the way the food looks, uh, except in a dry form when it comes in. So that's stomach. Um, so then the food material will move from the stomach once it's had some time for those, those digestive enzymes to work on. Uh, the food material. It'll move from the stomach down into the small intestine and this is the beginning of the small intestine right here. Okay, I've put my scissors in there uh, as a probe, but I think, can everybody see? Uh, <laughs> I guess I don't need to turn it towards you, but uh, there clearly is the beginning of the small intestine. I'm going to dissect uh, first part of the small intestine away from this supporting tissue. Sort of a blunt dissection here. And I want to remove this connective tissue that sits between the small intestine and the body wall. And within that tissue is the pancreas. Okay, and that's what, that's what you see here. This is pancreatic tissue. 
Um, this sort of pinkish tan kind of colored tissue embedded there. It's a little bit of fat over the top of it, but that's pancreatic tissue. Uh, the pancreas in, in uh, mammals is not a very nice discrete organ that you can just go in and, and pluck out. Uh, it's a more diffuse kind of an organ. And again, here you can get a sense of that. That's, that's pancreatic tissue right there. Okay, and there are very uh, numerous small ducts that come from that pancreatic tissue and feed into this upper portion of the small intestine. That's the duodenum, the first part of the small intestine. The other thing, okay, uh, so that pancreatic tissue um, produces enzymes that are essential for digestion. Um, there are enzymes, there are uh, pancreatic amylase enzymes that break down starch. There's a pancreatic lipase that breaks down fat and a pancreatic uh, 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 proteolytic enzymes, those are trypsin, chymotrypsin, and carboxypeptidase. Those, all of those enzymes, all five of those, are secreted from the pancreas through small ducts into this first part of the small intestine. And so that's where we really begin uh, the, the, the uh, major phase of chemical digestion of uh, of this uh, food material. Um, the other organ that contributes to digestion at this point is the liver. So let's look at the liver for a moment. Um, let's see here, there's a little bit of discoloration on it uh, in this particular liver specimen, but it's, um, I'm gonna discard that pancreas. Here you can see the liver in its, its basic structure. We've got uh, you know, several major lobes to it. You can see some places where it's been cut. This is where the meat inspector has looked over this carcass and examined the liver. Uh, the liver is a great place to look for any kinds of signs of disease or infection. Uh, if there's been any kind of parasite load on it, a lot of those will reside in the liver. Uh, any kind of uh, areas where there's been some uh, breakdown of liver tissue uh, would be an indication of some sort of disease state and, and so on. So the uh, so meat inspectors will very typically do a, a thorough examination of the liver to, uh, to determine if the animal is healthy or not. So this is the front side of the liver. If you were, again, the sort of, if we're looking at the animal uh, laying on its back, this being the belly surface, what we call the ventral surface, this is what the liver looks at, or looks like. I'm gonna flip that over and allow us to look at the bottom side. And here's where the main contributor to digestion from the liver is located. This is the gallbladder. The gallbladder stores bile. The liver makes bile. Bile is an emulsifying agent that uh, helps with um, the, the uh, digestion of fat. And so um, the liver t cells make the bile. Uh, it's, it accumulates by ducts from the liver into the, into the gallbladder. And then the gallbladder is linked by the major uh, bile duct to the duodenum, something like this. Okay, and so that's how we get bile into that upper portion of the digestive tract. So what I want to do next, I'm going to open up the bile duct and I'm going to express some of the bile into a tube so you can see what that looks like. That's a good look at, uh, there's what the, what the bile looks like. 
expressed from that uh, from the bile duct. Of course, that then is going to be deposited in the duodenum uh, and help with digestion there uh, in that part of the small intestine. So the small intestine then is now has all of these external enzymes have been added uh, from the pancreas, from the liver, and now we're beginning the, like I said, the real active portion of digestion of the food material. And normally what we would do in the classroom when we dissect uh, the digestive tract is we would uh, clean away all of the small intestine and dissect it free from the membranes that hold it in place and just, just go through that. But that's a very long, tedious process. I don't want to spend, you know, a lot of uh, videotaping time on that. Um, yeah, yeah, I'm just making a mess. So, um, so anyway, this is the first part of the small intestine, the duodenum. That then, you know, if we go through here, uh, we will, uh, you know, we can just follow this course through all of this small intestine material. And let's focus in on the, on the small intestines. I'm gonna try and isolate a, uh, a small portion here and see what, what that looks like. Yeah, that, that looks good right, right in here. Okay. So, this would be a loop here in the mid portion of the, the small intestine. And you can see that along one margin of the small intestine, there's a membrane system that holds that, that loop of the small intestine in place. And that's the mesentery. And within the mesentery are numerous blood vessels. And these blood vessels come from, uh, there, there are mesenteric arteries that feed blood into the small intestine. And then those arteries branch off into arterioles and then into capillaries that are in the walls of the small intestine. Those absorb the nutrients that are being broken down during digestion and, uh, you know, into the blood. And then there are mesenteric veins that leave the mesentery and come together at the base of the mesentery. And we can't really see that here at this point. But there are, the, there are these, these major vessels that feed into, the, uh, into a major, single, uh, large vein that leaves the mesentery, and that's called the hepatic portal vein. The hepatic portal vein carries blood from the small intestine to the liver so that all of these nutrients that have just been digested and absorbed can be processed in the liver and then distributed to the rest of the body. So the mesentery is really a very important organ. I think it's very often uh, ignored. There's some other interesting features of the mesentery. You can see it real nicely here. The base of the mesentery, you can see these dark patches of tissue. I think those are quite apparent. Those are lymph nodes. And uh, these nodes are part of, the, um, part of the immune system. And so any kind of microorganism, any bacteria, pathogen, the germ that could possibly want to enter through the digestive tract will end up you know, being uh, brought in, uh, if it, it does cross the intestinal wall and get into this uh, me uh, mesenteric vasculature, into these mesenteric veins, has to go to these lymph nodes where uh, the immune system can attack those and help uh,
combat any kind of potential infection. So that's, uh, that's another striking feature. And you see those throughout the mesentery. You'll see these numerous lymph nodes there uh, throughout that whole length. The other obvious feature of the mesentery is all of the fat that's associated with it. And so this is another area in the abdomen, abdomen where we store fat. Um, so between what you saw with the omentum and the fat storage we have there, and then fat storage in the mesentery, those are the two major depots of, of fat, abdominal fat. You know, generally mammals will deposit fat in two places, two, two major places, either underneath the skin so any of the fat that you associate with your limbs or uh, those parts of your body under the skin, that's subcutaneous fat. And then the other depot is the, the, the belly fat that will accumulate. And that's really in the uh, omentum and in the mesentery. Okay, and then as I said, uh, if we were doing this in our uh, introductory lab class in animal science, we would dissect away uh, the, lar or the small intestine from the mesentery and actually calculate a length. But again, for the sake of time, we're not going to dissect all of that free, but I just do want to give you a sense of, of what that looks like here, you know, what this, this small intestine looks like. There's there's a nice section of it that's been dissected free from those mesenteric connections, and you can get a good look at, uh, at what it looks like. Okay, so that's the small intestine. What we've done now is isolate just uh, the very last portion of the small intestine. This is the ileum, and then the large intestine. And so the ileum, again, last portion of the small intestine, there is a, a sphincter or valve here at the junction where the ileum dumps into the large intestine. It's the ileal cecal junction. And uh, here you see uh, the cecum. The cecum is a blind-ended pouch. Um, and uh, one of the portions of the large intestine, the you can see the ileum comes down in here. Food material can go into the cecum, or it can move in this direction and into the colon. First part of the large intestine here going in this direction. Doesn't really matter which way it goes. Food material can go into the cecum. The cecum will undergo contractions and force the food material back out, allow food material in and out. And so there's a lot of mixing and contractions that go on in that portion of the tract to move food material in and out of the cecum, in and out of the large intestine. Um, <clears throat> and uh, the large intestine is really the primary site for microbial digestion. And you can see in this tract, it's, uh, even, it's been kept on ice for several days, but the microbes that are in there, uh, even at that low temperature, have been metabolizing and generating some gas. And that's why you see these, these bubbles here uh, throughout uh, the, the tract. And, and the tract is really designed to have constrictions in it and form these little micro sacs throughout, again, to allow the food material to go up and move out and move up and out and allow the microbes to have plenty of time then to work on the undigested food material that's passed through the, the tract. Um, and so, again, this is the major site of microbial digestion. What gets to the small intestine is food material that has been not been digested up above, okay? Um, hopefully, in the small intestine, um, we have about 90% effectiveness as far as digestion of starch, um, about 90% as far as protein goes, 
about 40 to 60 percent effectiveness in digestion of the fat. Um, but any kind of fibrous material, um, any stems, leaves, uh, you know, vegetative kind of matter um, that can't be digested in the upper part of the tract will get down into the cecum and the colon, those portions of the large intestine, and that's where then microbes will, will act and, and help break that material down. Um, so that's uh, really, again, the main function here of the, the large intestine is uh, for microbial digestion. All this sacculation, the blind-ended pouch of the cecum, all of that there is to slow the movement of food material down to give microbes plenty of time to, uh, to digest that previously undigested material. Then uh, eventually that food material will, most of it will make its way down uh, the colon and then into this last part here. This is the rectum. Uh, along the way there's a lot of active water reabsorption. So the uh, food material that's come down from the small intestine has got a lot of liquid to it. Um, all of the enzymes that have been secreted from the pancreas and the bile and so on in the stomach, all of the water that's associated with the um, hydrochloric acid secretion and so on, all of that's been in liquid. And uh, so it's in the tail end of the large intestine, the tail end of the, of the uh, colon, that we get reabsorption of all of that water back, recovery of that water. And so that goes on here, and then we end up with relatively solid fecal matter then that is uh, eventually defecated out the rectum uh, via the anus.